There's a reason why Xtrades is currently the fastest growing application on the market for sharing financial ideas. With over $2.5 million paid in the last two years to contributors, users are flocking to see what trades the top traders on the leaderboard are sharing in real time. If you're looking to grow your reputation as a trader on the internet or discuss your trading ideas with other reputable investors, click the link below and get connected with the trading mentor today, completely free of charge. All right, what's up, everybody? This is Alex from X Trades, and welcome back to another weekly trade ideas list. I hope everybody had a wonderful trading week last week. I myself personally really didn't have that good of a week, but it comes with the territory with trading. I have a little drawdown to make back next week. Nothing I'm not familiar with in my six years of trading, but wasn't the best. That's okay. Going into it with a fresh mind this week. Hope everybody has a good week coming up this week as well. And we'll get back to work. Last week, I would say there was only about one setup that worked out of our three that we looked at last week. And that was Intel. Intel had a pretty good close on Friday and overall closed green on the week. FCX, not so much. It actually faked out over the trend line a couple times was not able to break to the upside as well as UNG kind of having a slow start although I think that's still oversold and I did buy some shares on it to give it time to kind of fart around at lows so I still feel pretty good about UNG or natural gas in general eventually it's probably gonna have a dead cat bounce and I'm still holding that just grabbed about 50 shares just a small position on UNG but we do have some new setups this week probably gonna be looking at all majority day trades there might be a couple that have swing trade potential as well but we'll go into those after we go over our intro here we go over the economic calendar first and then we go over seasonality and then we'll get right into the charts so this week's data we do have some big ones coming in we have a couple fed speakers starting out here on monday you can see we have cash kari and also fed bowman speaking lately though fed speakers have not really had too much impact on the market a lot of them have different stances on monetary policy and I feel like the only one that really matters the most is Jerome Powell. So everybody's always listening for Jerome Powell. Back in the day or a couple of years ago, at least, we did have one other Fed speaker. His name was James Bullard, but he's not here anymore. He had a pretty good impact on the market when he would talk. It was really just him and Powell that kind of had the most impact when it comes to Fed speakers or really any random event they speak at. Not so much anymore. So it's always a hit or miss with Fed speakers, but it's definitely worth paying attention to. You never know what they're going to say and how the algorithms are going to react to their headlines. And then on Tuesday, it's going to be the big one of the week. Nice and early. It's going to be the CPI print. So it's very important that we keep seeing CPI trend lower as well as PCE, which they also pay attention to. CPI and PCE are always the most important inflation gauges, in my opinion. And really, the thesis has been very simple. You just want to see core CPI as well as CPI in general just go lower. And really, any signs of stickiness or that it's not going down, it does kind of take away the odds for rate cuts. And that's when the market reacts negatively. So you want to see the continued trend lower. CPI has been trending lower. I would say the Fed has been doing a really good job bringing down the CPI, whether you think it's from the rate hikes or not, or you think it was just transitory and supply chains fixed themselves and it came down naturally. Either way, when they started raising rates, CPI started coming down shortly after as well. And it's been a constant downtrend since. So just want to see that trend lower. Keep seeing the same thing. Looks like the medium forecast is going to be 0.3 for a core. And it's going to be year over year, 2.9%. Uh, and then core CPI year over year, 3.7%. So those are your medium forecasts. Either you want to see them come in line, like directly at the median or a little bit below. And then on Wednesday, just more Fed speakers. Cool as being Michael Barr. I really haven't seen them move the market that much. Maybe the fact that it's after CPI that could definitely, you know, have some implications if they speak on the CPI print, basically the day after it comes out and maybe their thoughts on monetary policy going forward, that can definitely move us. But like I said, earlier fed speakers besides jerome powell haven't really been moving the market that much and then thursday we do have a couple of things actually that could be worth watching this empire state manufacturing survey as well as the philadelphia fed manufacturing survey that will be worth paying attention to it really just depends on how extreme the reading is and then as well as u.s retail sales it's probably the most important one compared to these two uh, retail sales is definitely probably going to be paid attention to the most. And then it looks like we have a couple more Fed speakers later. It's going to be Fed Waller and also Bostic. And then Friday, we do get an inflation gauge on the producer side. It's going to be the PPI or the producer price index. So definitely pay attention to that on Friday. That's going to be the big one for the day. And then at 10 a.m., we do have consumer sentiment as well. This always usually brings mid-session volatility. And you will see a kind of an initial big pop or drop just based off this reading and it just depends how it comes in always depends on the extremes how far over 
or how below you know the median or expected forecast comes in. So that's for the economic calendar. Most important is going to be CPI. I would say second most important, probably going to be the PPI on Friday. Third most important, maybe the second most important compared to PPI is going to be retail sales. And then consumer sentiment as well. I would say this is also equally as important as the PPI or really anything else. Consumer sentiment really kind of gives insight into how people think about the economy right now. And that also kind of ties back into inflation expectations and other things. And on to the seasonality real quick, we're going to go over this week. It's going to be February 12th through the 16th or the monthly options expiration. This is going to be a huge expiration. There's a lot of money expiring specifically on this date. As with any other monthly options, the monthlies always have the most open interest. They always have the most volume as well traded. So they naturally always have the most amount of money expiring compared to weekly contracts or anything else. The monthlies are always the most active. So you can see for the last 20 years here, summarized profit is going to be 15% for this period. Winning trades at a whopping 84%, which is really good. Average yearly profit almost at a full percent at about three quarters at 0.76. And overall, just a really high probability that the market could go up this week as a last hurrah before we get that negative drawdown here going into March and towards the end of the month in February. If we go down to 15 years, probably give us something similar. You can see winning trades the past 15 years is at 86%, summarized profit at 12%, with an average yearly profit at 0.8%, actually a little bit higher than the 20-year data set. And if we go down to 10 years for the more recent years, you can see we have winning trades at 80%, summarized profit at 8%, average yearly profit the last 10 years at 0.82%. So it's pretty good. Every single data set, 10, 15, and 20 years, all looking pretty bullish looking pretty good for your last hurrah. The only issue is we're at extremely overbought levels on semis, on indexes, on tech, really anything you could think of. Market is very extended to the upside and it's just had a killer run really for the last year now. And that does bring some risk for drawdown and you don't want to enter the top. I mean, nobody wants to enter the top. They usually like discounts. And I always recommend, you know, looking at the moving averages and buying at the 9 to 21 EMAs at the higher loads. It's better risk to reward and also less drawdown risk as well. And you get a better discount on premium, on options, on shares, really anything if you're buying dips. So right now, market's at a 52-week high breakout, which is pretty aligned with the seasonality. Last week, I mean, we were supposed to average a little bit of chop maybe it's a light pullback. We did kind of get that Monday and Tuesday, and we'll go over that in the indexes next when we get into the charts. But overall, to close out the week, Friday was just killer, and we did break out more. Even after that slight resistance on Monday and Tuesday, we were still able to make more highs, and we closed that new highs on Friday as well with SPX past 5,000 right now. It's crazy. But that's for the seasonality. Looking pretty bullish for one last hurrah this week. Definitely be a little bit more skeptical though with the data on Tuesday. I don't blame you if you don't want to hold through a big data set like CPI, especially at the levels we're at now. You know, sell the news is real. You know, even if it's good news after a data set like that, it can still sell off. So you got to be careful holding through stuff like that. Make sure you buy time on your side. Have at least, you know, 30 plus to 60 days of expiration on your options. Don't gamble on weeklies if you're going to hold them overnight unless you're you know taking a really small position because otherwise it can bite you in the ass and on to the setups this week so we do have three our first one here we're looking at iwm which is a pretty clear bullish breakout really last week i liked this a lot better at this demand you can see it's a drop base rally demand i posted this demand in the chat earlier in the week i was looking for some type of bounce as well as this little one week 9 to 21 ema combo you can see your 9 and your 21 right here it also bounced from this. So that EMA combo on the one week was also another thing I was looking for besides that one day demand. And it did bounce pretty good. I unfortunately didn't catch it. We did an IWM a couple weeks ago. We took profit on. I as well had a call spread on it. I took profit on that as well. And it pulled back for like almost a week straight right here in this period. We sold in this little area up here. I don't think I got exactly up to, you know, the 199s. I was probably taking profit at like 198s, 197s or something, but it's still a pretty good trade. And I really like this re-entry down here. I just didn't get a chance to get into it. So this was a great value area as well as it's, it looked way more discounted than your techs, your semis, really anything, especially at these levels. I mean, it's just tough to buy, you know, Nvidia 700 plus, you know, buy SMCI at the level it's at. Even ARM had like a 50% run after earnings and, you know, AI and semis are just really hard to chase, especially if you like discounts or value areas. A lot of things left the value area in 2022 and 2023. So if you're a value searcher and you're looking for discounts, it's been a little bit tougher. 
to find laggers and to find good laggers that are going to move when the market goes up as well and not just totally shit the bed when the market pulls back just a little bit because those laggers when the indexes go down just a little bit those laggers can go down aggressively as well so you have to be careful choosing kind of what kind of discounts you want to look for and what kind of stocks you want and make sure you're not just trying to call the bottom on something and you want to find something that can still find a trend and not just shit the bed with the market at the slightest pullback so i'd say iwm has kind of been a little bit of a lagger you can see here we get a test one a test two uh, there's a little test three rejection on this bar right here if we went down to the one hour you could see there's actually test one a test two and a test three so this downtrend was confirmed and this was official so now that it's broken out we want to see a break over 199.41 it's pretty clear we closed directly at it it's pretty simple it will need to get over this maybe if it can make a base off this that'd be even better and then it could head up to 205s so your free space on IWM is probably just 200 to 205 until you get to this big peak right here. You probably even mark this as a supply zone as well. This is a rally-based drop supply zone. See, it's a rally-based drop. So you can probably mark the 204s as well, just 204 to 205 as a potential price target, assuming it can get over 199s to 200. But this little resistance point right here, we will need to break over that. And that's your little free space. Another possibility with a breakout like this, it's not always just going to go straight up. Sometimes you will get setups that do just go straight up after a breakout like this, but sometimes they will come back and try to back test, kind of shake people out make a little shoulder and then head a little bit higher. I could do that as well. Maybe if Monday it gapped down for some reason or really anything, really any early week dip, it could be bought up and give a better discount as well. That way you're not just buying directly at 199s or 200s. But as well, if it could break over that 200, there's a pretty clear break and it probably will try to shoot up to the 205s. It has been lagging and there is some meat on the bone. The only issue is with IWM as well is the bonds have been going lower, which means yields have been going higher. And that does kind of bring a little bit of pressure as we saw the last couple of weeks. This is probably due to the TLT going down as well. Usually you want to see rates going lower, yields going lower to see you know small caps and mid caps go up because they're more yield sensitive. So that's for IWM. I'm looking at calls with caution, of course. Need to see a break over the one. 99s to 200s with a potential to dip into a back test maybe not sure if it will early in the week or at some point but that is another area you could watch if it does that if it does dip you don't have to be scared instantly of course just make sure it's holding outside the downtrend line if it fails to do that it goes back within you could look at something else you know fake outs do happen we saw it on fcx last week it broke out went back down came back out went back down so it did that like three times and you know Technicals are not, they're not perfect and they're not going to work every single time. So got to be prepared for that. All right, next we're going into Penn. They do have earnings this week. So I wanted to mention that. Looks like it's on the 15th. So you're going to want to look at day trades on this mainly. I definitely wouldn't swing through earnings or anything unless you bought a lot of time. Like if you bought six months out or three months out and you really wanted to trade this breakout and hold through their report with a potential for it to rocket higher because it's been so discounted and so low for so long that kind of does increase the probability for their earnings to kind of be lowballed and they will be and then you know it can go higher we've seen it time and time again on lots of things you know wall street analysts they set their expectations low and then you know when they actually beat the market acts like it was surprised but really they had low expectations to begin with and that's called sandbagging so that could happen with pen not exactly sure i don't have a crystal ball and i don't recommend swinging through earnings it's very risky but if you buy three to six months of expiration on any options or even if you just bought shares or something instead it's safer than swinging weeklies or lottos you know trying to capitalize on that earnings move because lots of times you know after earnings they can just open flat it'll crush you it'll crush your iv because after earnings naturally the next day your iv V percentile will drop off because naturally the market goes into earnings with the expectation that's going to move a lot which increases the price when implied volatility is higher your premiums also increase and if market makers are expecting these big moves they're going to price it higher that way they don't get screwed so after implied volatility gets priced in higher the event comes out the implied volatility drops off because the event is done and it's less risky. So naturally, IV drop off is gonna show up no matter what, which is why you need the expected move of earnings to happen, as well as you need your deltas to make up for the IV drop. But Penn is pretty clear here. You got a test one, a test two. Try to reject on test three, just breaking out now. So maybe we can see a little bit of momentum on this, just up into earnings. 
you know, you have a couple of days to trade it up until Thursday, I think. So there's really only one level here at 24.57. That's your most recent peak. If you can get up to that, definitely watch that for a resistance. If it can break over that, you can start looking for the 26.47s. Although I don't think it's just going to bust that high up into earnings, you know, in a week. It may take the earnings report to even get any higher than that. So just look for day trades or, you know, quick call scalps on this. Something with momentum if this uh, breakout continues. So let's repent. Earnings coming up on Thursday. Maybe just stick to day trades up until then. But definitely keep an eye on this breakout because it has been kind of trapped and little bit of a downtrend now trying to break out of that there could be some momentum and on to smh which is our last setup here for individual tickers this is also an etf i guess in a way this is kind of an index the smh here i'm just looking for potential resistance off of this upper channel line is pretty straightforward this is kind of contrarian and you are going against the trend a little bit which is why you want to wait for some type of one day bar showing that there's a reaction to the upper channel line or if you're going to enter directly up here assuming it doesn't gap up and get outside this channel line on monday or really any other day as long as it's staying you know under this line here and staying within the channel there's a chance it can reject just keep an eye on that but if you do go into it directly at the channel line just keep your stop loss tight because if it blows through you'll wish you did and there's also another way to go about it like i said wait for a nice little red bar something showing you clear resistance something like this that will go into something like this the next day you got a 2% down move after this one little red bar. If you can get something like that, that could give you a pattern down to 195s or 195.90. So it could get down there. If it can reject off there, this would be a back test area and it could hold as support. So you definitely want to watch that. And it will need to flush under that 195.90 as well to even go lower, to even think about heading to this little trend line, test one, test two. There is no test three on this. So this trend line is unconfirmed, but eventually I would imagine it's probably going to test it at some point. You just don't know the time frame on it, really. You just know eventually it could get down here and test this and try to hold it up as a trend because this is kind of the value line. This is where you see the most size being added at. These are the discount areas. So that's for SMH looking at puts. Obviously, your invalidation area. If it just gets way too far outside the channel line and it's just going parabolic, kind of like it is right now, you know, just look at something else. And if Monday, for some reason, it gaps up over it, that's kind of your signal to just wait for it to get back inside before trying. Just use this line as a, you know, as a guide, as a, tr as a trend guide. But hopefully, you know, it could see a little bit of resistance. It may take the NVIDIA earnings, which comes up in a couple of weeks, I think. At some point, you know, semis may not have any downside until then. Really until all of these semiconductor names get their earnings out. And I believe NVIDIA is one of the last big ones to come out. So we'll see how that goes and on to the indexes we're going over spy here so i mean it's pretty straightforward it's been in an uptrend here see a test one you got a test two a test three uh made a new demand zone right here it's kind of a rally base rally zone once it broke this higher high right here this demand zone was confirmed this would actually be a really good area to buy at if it can pull into this area right here at the 488s or even if it pulled into the trend line that'd be a, a nice little scalp area you could look for calls once it hits the line but otherwise it's just in a 52 week breakout or melt up pattern right now it really has been like this for weeks if we had the moving averages you could see i mean a couple of weeks ago we've been over how it dipped into the 9 and 21 and it continued that and i've just been mentioning to keep using the 9 and 21 combo kind of as your trend gauge as long as it's staying over these you know, the market can stay really bullish and it's proved us that for months now. You got a test here, a test here, a test here. You got a pull in right here and here and here as well. So probably sound like a broken record, but just keep using that 9 to 21 gauge. Really nothing has changed. MACD is still positive as well. Honestly, it probably will need to get back under 480 overall to even be bearish. 480 is kind of your key level or previous all-time high all the way from over here. It would need to get under that to even kind of get a real bearish reversal. Short term though, uh, if it could get under this 495, that 495 area is a short-term resistance, kind of a breakout point right here as well. So if it could get back under that, that could be a short-term bearish level as well. Otherwise, this 495 could act as a back test area as well and you got your trend line support plus the EMA so overall it's still bullish for now no bearish reversal nothing screaming downside here just yet other than the simple fact of overbought conditions and really just media I mean people are just buying 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 regardless of higher interest rates regardless of anything people are just inclined to buy right now maybe it's just Wall Street maybe it's not really individual investors 
Who knows? Usually when it's moving like this, you have a broad market participating. Wall Street, individual traders, money managers, everybody kind of buying into the hype, getting as much as they can before it shits the bed. So I really don't have a setup for you on this. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. It's just in a melt-up pattern. And maybe if you can get back under this 496 or 495s, if you can get back under this, that'd be a good area to try some put scalps or something. But otherwise, you know, if it can pull into the 9 and 21 combo like it did back here, that's a good dip buy as well, or to at least make an attempt. And that's really my only areas I like to buy at, just the 9 and 21 combos or some type of back test area like 496, if we can get back into that. Look for a scalp off 496s. If I could pull into the trend line at some point, hold it up. That's a good area to try as well. Just anything other than buying into highs or 52 week highs. So the indexes, the, end of the setups really aren't that great right now. And I feel like there's been more opportunity for discounts and dip buys and other things lately. So that's for this buy. There's really no setup here. It's just in a melt up pattern. Watch that 49605. It's probably the most recent short term resistance. And there's really no other resistance here. This is uncharted territory. So I can't really give you anything other than this 496, uh, these 9 and 21 EMAs, and also this overall uptrend line that's lasted a couple months now, all the way from october lows so that's for the spy just be careful up here as usual vix is very low and there's just no incentive to sell so wait for a volatility signal if you must before trying to short or if you did start a put position because you thought it was overbought you know buy lots of time start really small one contract or something something small and then you can add later if you ended up correct add into strength instead of you know, starting big and averaging down later. And on to stocks above their 50-day moving average. This is actually S&P stocks above their 50-day moving average. So this is relative to the SPY that we just looked at. We looked at this last week. We were looking at a huge divergence between this and the SPY. You got SPY making all-time highs, S&P stocks above their 50-day going lower with really no change from last week. So here's Friday's close. We have Monday, breath was kind of weak. We had a little recovery on Tuesday and three days a chop. So this is just an indicator. It's not a tradable security. We're just seeing breadth in the S&P 500 and seeing if it aligns with the actual S&P 500. And lately it has been not. So we'll get rid of all the drawings and we'll go over it again. So last week we basically just kind of made a note where you have really clear correlation between S&P stocks about their 50 day moving average and also the SPY. You can see when S&P stocks about their 50 day are going lower you got the SPY going lower. You have a short-term recovery right here. You have the indicator going up as well. Pull back, rally back up. And you see the market's moving really smooth when S&P stocks above their 50-day are also moving with the SPY. What we started to notice a month ago, the orange line, which is this indicator right here that we were just looking at, this started to collapse or go lower about a month ago while SPY has continued to go higher, largely because of mega caps and good earnings and basically just the mega caps carrying everything while you have the majority of S&P stocks going back below their 50 day moving average spy has continued to make all time highs. So there's a big divergence between breadth and the actual index itself. So it's basically the same story. There's no change in breadth from last week. I could even show you again. You have no change. You don't have breadth recovering plus the S&P going up at the same time. You just have breadth stalling out here at lows, making no attempt to go higher and show a little bit more health while the spy continues to march higher and go higher. Now, I have no idea if this is a leading indicator. These things could take months, weeks to play out. You can see the divergence has already lasted over a month. See the indicator going lower all the way back here. And it's just been in a divergence since about January 4th. So it lasted longer than a month now. It's just something you want to keep in mind. Usually you see the best market moves when breath is in order. You have S&P stocks with their 50 day going higher as well as the market also going higher. That's a, I would say a good sign of strength in my opinion, especially when it's moving positively correlated as well. Like such, even in downturns as well as upturns, you see the SPY has really good moves when it's all in order. Obviously, it still moved up pretty good here, but it's just important to pay attention to just because of the history of this indicator and the SPY also kind of moving together. I mean, I could show you a bunch of other examples all the way from 2022. You got breadth going lower. So the orange line is S&P stocks above their 50 day. And then the regular candles are SPY. See how they move so well together? Overall, when they move together, they do good together. And you don't really see any divergence back in 23, back in 2022. This new divergence is kind of more recent and we haven't really seen it in a couple of years. I could probably go back somewhere in the chart, maybe 2020 or 2021. I could, I could probably find a similar divergence of S&P stocks going lower while the market goes higher. And eventually the SPY kind of leading lower as well because you don't have S&P stocks 
recovering with it as well. So in a way, this could end up a leading indicator showing us that the stock market is not as strong as we think. And if you know the mega caps go lower, we're kind of screwed on the short term to medium term. So just something to pay attention to. Breath has not recovered while the S&P continues to make new highs. I'm not trying to scare anybody or anything like that. I'm just showing you the data and showing you what I've seen and kind of how this indicator has always had a relatively positive correlation and is also kind of lined up great with local tops in the SPY. As you can see, there's a big pullback here. You have breath going lower. You have the market going lower. Uh, once it recovered, aligned well with the bottom right here. So, I mean, it works both ways. So this divergence has just really caught my eye and I've been paying attention to it and made me a little bit more skeptical, to, you know, to go along the market up here. That's all. And on to the QQQ. So last week we actually had a 430 as our key level, which I thought looked pretty good for like put scalps, you know, and it worked pretty good Monday and Tuesday. If we go to the short term time frames, it worked really good for day trades. Here's Monday uh, open flushed right off 430s. And then also Tuesday as well, flushed off 430s again. So you had two days of the downside uh, for put scalps, which is good because that means the market's still respecting technicals, at least on the short term. You can see once it broke out of 430 right here, this is when the market got a little bit melty and then just chopped the rest of the week and the trading wasn't great. And then we have Friday where it had a even bigger breakout. But arguably, it's because we broke over this 430, which was the most recent big resistance. If you want to even call it big, I mean, this is pretty small. You did have a nice rejection back here. So this 430 was respected for a little bit. And that's probably why once it broke over that 430, we had a pretty good move here to the upside. Because this was like one top, two, three. So you had almost like a triple top or three rejections off 430. That's probably why... There was so much enthusiasm once we got over that and it was able to melt up and continue. So unfortunately, I like the shorts the best just because of the resistance. And I had no idea if it's going to break out. But once you do get that breakout and it close over the 430, you, you can kind of assume that it's going to continue to try to follow the trend. Right. And you wouldn't want to go back short until it starts closing back under 430. And that's kind of the rules I've used for years now. You know, I don't really like shorting. Right. And, you know, trying to call the top too much. If it does look extended enough, I'll try something off of a, you know, a big parabolic move like this. But I really like the already established levels. And that's why I liked the puts last week off of the 430s because this level was already established. And then once it broke over, it kind of loses, you know, some interest in shorts. And rightfully so because we start melting and, you know, continuing the trend. So that was for last week. That was obviously the only setup on the indexes that looked good. Spy, there's really no established resistance like that at least not like the qqq qqq had a better kind of short-term setup and worked well monday and tuesday but now we're actually broken over that so we have to look for something else so for qqq here it broke over 430 you have three days of breakout continuation and now trying to come up into the upper channel line similar to smh so the smh chart is pretty similar to qqq or the nasdaq its waves are almost identical SMH might have a little bit of a bigger move because semis have moved so much. And QQQ is not just made up of semis, but it's similar. You know, they're both in a very similar pattern. The only difference is SMH is already at upper channel line. QQQ is not at upper channel line just yet exactly. Obviously, it doesn't have to get directly there to see resistance or anything like that. But, you know, you do want to see maybe a little bit closer to it before trying to short at it or look for any type of short-term resistance. And this is the only resistance point you can go off of. There's nothing else. There's no horizontal resistance. 430 was broken last week. Uh, it will need to get back under 430s and also break this little new demand zone. This is a rally base rally zone. Once it put in this higher high, this became a demand zone. So if it can pull back into the 430s or this demand zone, that's a good area to try call scalps or Maybe try to buy the dip for a couple of days. But that's really about it. I mean, you want to watch the 430s as a potential dip buy area. Otherwise, right now, you know, it's in a melt up pattern, not at a great entry to go long. And as well, coming up into upper channel line. So just mark your upper channel line. Start at this point on the 20th to January 24th and extend your line and it'll bring you up here. So just watch that line. That's really it. Uh, there's really nothing else technical wise other than it's already broken out uh, your entry to the long side should have been at the you know 430 breakout if you're going to try and as well as your short should have been at the 430s when you had two days to do so for day trades but that's really it guys just waiting for it to get to the upper channel line waiting for some type of dip maybe into 430s to give a better discount something something other than chasing into highs or buying into pretty much the worst spots possible in my opinion but that's the video guys hope you guys enjoy make sure you like comment and subscribe 
Like I said, mark your upper channel line starting from December 20th to January 24th for QQQ. This IWM looks really good. Potential breakout to the upside. Needs to break over 199s to 200s. You got Penn as a good short term setup before earnings. Maybe you can get some upside on this breakout. And SMH, similar to QQQ, SMH is actually already at the upper channel line. So look for potential resistance there. Just be careful. Wait for confirmation. This isn't a type of parabolic move while AI and semis go crazy. So just got to be very careful. Start small. Don't bet the farm on shorts right now. One contract at a time if you must. And that's about it. So make sure you like, comment, and subscribe to our X-Trades YouTube channel. I love you guys. I'm going to go ahead and get this chopped up, sent out, all that good stuff. So love you guys, and I'm out.